I've got the best job in the world. I'm a columnist on the FT, and every week I write about whatever I like, um, which is normally the idiocies of corporate life. Um, I've, got a, I've got a real title, but I like to think that my actual title is the FT's chief bullshit correspondent. Um, as there's so much bullshit in the corporate world, it means that I never run out of things to write about. But as well as that, I've interviewed famous people, and I get invited to review holidays in swanky, exotic locations. I mean, the whole thing is so cushy and such fun, it explains why I've been doing it actually for 32 years, is the, same, is the shameful truth. Um, but, I mean, really, if I think that compared to that amount of fun, by next September, what I am going to be doing is turning up at an inner city comprehensive school before seven every morning and teaching maths. I do think, why? Every teacher I know tells me that at the beginning when I'm training, if I don't end the day in floods of tears, I'm going to be doing very well. But also, I've swapped. I'm, you know, I'm, I've, I've been a journalist for so long, I'm really quite senior. And in my new life, I'm going to be starting again at the very bottom. But not just me, I've persuaded 40 people, all roughly my age, which is to say, give or take, I mean, I'm 57, um, and some a bit older, some a bit younger, to give up whatever swanky jobs they've been doing and start again as teachers too. So when I tell people that this is what they're doing, everyone says the same thing. They all say, God, that's really brave in that tone of voice that means that's completely nuts. Um, and sometimes I think it's completely nuts too. And this question, why, is something I keep asking myself. And the first reason is that I'm not getting better at what I do. And my writing is no better than it used to be. And actually, at three in the morning, I often think that I'm getting worse. And the reason that I admit that so openly is I don't think that's at all unusual. I mean, business school st students love the learning curve. And in most professions, um, after 20 years, you've really stopped learning anything new, if you're honest. And after 30, most of us are at complete screaming point. Um, so out there are all these people who have been doing their jobs for too long. But how we think about our jobs is wrong. I mean, when I was little, people used to say to me, what do you want to be when you grow up? As if the answer to that question was just one thing. But actually, and that may make sense if, our, if, if, if we work for 40 years, but increasingly, we're going to work for 50 or 60 years. So that's completely mad. Now, I've just ty I typed in my details into a life expectancy calculator. And it reliably informs me I'm going to live till I'm 94. So if I am retired for, say, 20 years or something, that still means, even at my age, I've got another slice of 20 years in which to have another career. So that explains why I need a new career, but it doesn't explain why on earth it's something as bruising as teaching. So then you think about your motivations for work. When I started out and wanted to be a journalist, I thought it was glamorous. I'm totally post-glamour now, um, so that doesn't amuse me anymore particularly. Equally, I'm that lucky generation. I own my own house, so earning a lot of money isn't so important. I'm post-status. I really blissfully don't actually care what people think of me, so I'm freed of all of these things. It puts me right at the top of Maslow's famous hierarchy of needs. I'm kind of at the meaning stage. So my search for meaning, I thought, you know, I want to do something that is useful. And pricking pins into the pomposity of corporate life, it's kind of useful in a way, but only in a way, and actually it hasn't made the corporate life any less pompous, so I really don't think I've necessarily achieved that much. I want to do something concrete and useful. My search for that didn't take me very far. It took me straight to my mum, 
who was a teacher at the school that I went to in the 1970s. Now, we all know the cliches about teachers change lives, but actually, we remember our favorite teachers forever. And whenever I meet people who were at Camden School for Girls with me in the 1970s, they're never particularly pleased to see me, but they always go on about the lessons my mum gave 40 years ago. Equally, my search took me to my daughter, who left, she left university at 22 and became a teacher right away in a really, really poor part of Leeds. And at first, she was crying at the end of the day. But then at the end of her first year, she showed me this little card that had been written to her by a kid um, who was one of the most difficult, nightmarish, impossible kids who she had taught. And it just said, you're awesome, miss. And <laughs> Looking at this card, I know this is again something that I shouldn't admit to, but I felt jealous of my own daughter. I thought, actually, I want some of that too. And so she actually teaches history and my mum English. But I thought, I'm going to teach maths, which you might think is weird after having spent a whole life in words, but you can get tired of words after a while. I mean, they're so sort of ambiguous and slippery, and I've had so many opinions. I don't want to have any more opinions. I just want numbers. I want the beautiful simplicity of numbers. And I'm also actually enraged by all of these people who I meet in this country who keep saying, oh, I'm no good at maths, as if it was a sort of cute little, you know, nice little quirk that, that they're quite proud of. Nobody should be useless at maths, and I really, really believe that. So fired up like this, I set out, this was a bit over a year ago, to be a teacher. And uh, I was put off immediately. If you look at the government's websites, they're all sort of gorgeous, sort of grinning 25-year-olds. And then if you apply, you fill in a UCAS form aimed at 18-year-olds. But worst of all, you have to produce your GCSE certificates. <laughs> now, I'm way too old to have even sat GCSEs. And as to the whereabouts of my O-level certificates, which is what I did say, I mean, they're in some long distant lost attic somewhere. I don't know where they are. So I would have given up. But about that time, my father died. And there's something about a death. It absolutely stops you in your tracks. And it makes you think, am I doing what I actually want to do? And I thought, no, I'm not. I really do want to be a maths teacher. And at the same time, every time you look in the news, there's another story about the teacher crisis. All the numbers are going in the wrong way. By 2025, there's going to be an extra half a million kids in British secondary schools. The number of teachers is shrinking. Um, the government keeps pumping money into teacher recruitment, but even so, especially in maths and physics, it's 20% below its targets. So, I mean, it's a really, really grim picture. But there's one statistic in this that is my absolute favorite one. Last year, 35,000 people started their training as teachers. Of those, 73 were over 55. Now, just think about it. Those of you who aren't very good at maths, I can tell you that that is one-fifth of one percentage point. At least I hope my maths is right on that. Um, <laughs> which even those who are completely innumerate will realize is practically nothing. I thought of this scheme, which actually my daughter did, Teach First, which was set up 15 years ago to encourage the bright, great graduates coming out of university to become teachers, that that was cooler than going to work at McKinsey or Goldman Sachs or whatever. And it's been brilliantly successful. It's the biggest graduate employer in the country. But where was the opposite scheme? Where was the opposite scheme? All of those people who were fed up with working at McKinsey or Goldman Sachs and who would now like to be teachers. Where was the scheme for them? So, I got together with Katie Waldegrave, who um, was one of the first Teach First teachers and had been a social entrepreneur, and we agreed that we would start such a scheme. And I decided that the best title would be Teach Last, um, because, you know, everyone understands what it means. Well, I'm slightly insulted that you're laughing, because I thought... <laughs> 
I thought it was an absolutely brilliant idea. Um, other people said, actually, that's a useless name. It makes it sound as if it's the crematorium, um, the next stop. <laughs> So we've, we've gone for a very bland name, now, uh, now teach. The idea is done that, now teach. So we decided we would do a pilot first year. We would work in London only. We joined up with ARC, which is an educational charity and runs lots of schools. Um, and we would go particularly for those shortage subjects. Um, we had no much marketing budget at all. And so I thought, well, I'll write about it in the FT. I'll do a bit of broadcasting, and we'll see what happens. Um, Katie and I had agreed between us, so long as we could be, say, eight would make a first good first year, that would sort of be OK. But we didn't know what to expect. No sooner had I written my first column in the FT and started talking about it on Radio 4, the applications flooded in. We have had a total of 1,000 applications. And I can't tell you that all of them are brilliant and suitable and will make marvelous teachers. Actually, one of my favorite that came in really in the first, in the first few hours was from somebody who had been a, a CEO and had a marvelous, um, marvelous CV. Um, and I thought, God, this is great. Only the next day, he sent me a very sheepish email saying that he had told his wife over supper that he had applied to be a teacher. And she had pointed out that he didn't like children very much. Um, actually, it was better than that. He didn't even like his own. Um, so very sheepishly, he withdrew his application. Um, but, but we've had all of those people, all of those McKinsey people, the Goldman people, and the bankers, the corporate lawyers, all of those people who have done corporate life. They've all applied. But what's really interesting to me is the actors, the musicians, the doctors, the pretty much, you know, even a few priests have applied. It seems this thing that 20 to 30 years doing one thing is just enough. We've all had enough and we all want to be useful. So that has just been, that has been so heartening and so completely amazing. But, so that, that in a way, that proves the first point. But it does not, alas, prove that now teach is a success. Um, the, the, next, the next question is, will the schools want us? Well, at first, you know, Katie and I were going around to visit head teachers. And I remember one sort of looked at me and he sort of said, what? 58-year-olds being teachers, you won't have the energy. It's exhausting, this job. And so I sort of, you know, sort of tried to persuade him otherwise and went home where all the 20-year-olds who live in my house, having got up at midday, <laughs> were then sort of flopped on the sofa. And I thought, hmm, it's not me who doesn't have the energy. So I sort of really felt quite annoyed about that. But luckily, his response was the minority. Most head teachers are, de well, they're basically, they're desperate for any teachers. But they seem to look on us kindly. They think, which has to be true, that all the experience we have from whatever it is we've been doing has got to be useful in the classroom. But there's something else too. If you've been around a bit as I have, I've got contacts. And the kids in these inner city schools that we are working in, they don't have any contacts. So that's got to be useful. That's got to be useful as well. And then there's a diversity point that really amuses me. The typical teacher is very young and female. The people who I'm bringing along are actually mainly male and quite old. So they are what passes for the diversity ticket in schools, which is sort of hilarious. Um, sort of hilarious, these people, you know, who have been in ascendancy, they've been in the ruling class for so long, will suddenly find themselves a possibly persecuted minority. It's kind of... <laughs> So I, 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 that, that um, yeah, <laughs> so, that, so that amuses me. So, but on the whole, yes, the schools want us. But that leaves a really more troubling point, which is, will we be any good at it? Now, the honest answer to that is I haven't got the first clue, but I will let you know in a couple of years' time. I mean, I suspect, though, that it will be like younger teachers. Some of us will be great, just as some younger teachers are great and some, and, 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 and some will be less so. But I feel, I feel what I've got going for me is not only the extra experience that I bring, it's that if you've lived for quite a while, you just are more resilient. You've had a few knocks and bruises, and I think that resilience will come in handy. I know how to manage my time. 
And particularly as a newspaper columnist, I don't think that any of those particular skills will be useful in the classroom. But I am really used to being told I'm rubbish. Um, <laughs> If you go online and look at any FT column that I've ever written, underneath there will be lots of people saying, I can't believe you get paid to write this. <laughs> um, I think that the thick skin that I've had to grow, that's got to come in handy in the classroom when a whole lot of 30 teenagers are um, implying the same thing, that I'm complete rubbish. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that will help. But you may be thinking, that I sound a bit complacent. Well, I'm not complacent. I'm so worried about this. I'm really, really worried. And my, my anxieties were not um, at all helped when a few weeks ago, I got an email from a journalist, um, also a journalist, at 45, she quit and she trained as a teacher. Two years later, she said she quit. She had pretty much had a nervous breakdown. The kids were rioting. The red tape was awful. It was hideous. And she said to me that I am being a Pied Piper. I'm leading bankers to certain slaughter in the classroom. <laughs> um, well, I'm glad you think it's funny. I mean, I, I don't think it's funny at all. But she isn't the only one to scent blood. Um, we have had 25 documentary filmmakers have all been in touch with us saying, can they make the Now Teach reality TV program? <laughs> That's because, of course, they think it's going to be so hilarious, the humbling of the derivatives trader, etc., etc. <laughs> Actually, I quite was in favor of the TV series, but everyone, sadly, has talked me out of it. Um, but anyway, back to the journalist. I, I emailed her back saying, yes, I completely understand. We're trying to mitigate the risk in various ways. Um, and we are forcing all of these thousands of people who have applied to go and actually spend a week in a school so that they really, really know what it's like. They know that teachers don't actually have time to go to the loo. And only once they've worked that out, and if they're still keen, then we'll look at them. Equally, we are not working with schools where the kids are rioting, um, but with well-managed schools. Um, and we're making our teachers jump through the same hoops as 22-year-olds um, to see if they're suitable. This woman was sort of only partly mollified, and she said, well, you know, let's just see, let's see how, you, how you get on. Let me know. Well, I will let her know. I'm going to let everyone know. I'm going to publicize the hell out of this and go on publicizing it. But how does that make me feel? Well, it makes me feel terrified, because I have to make this work. But whenever I think I'm making the most public mistake of my life, I think of this maths teacher whose lesson I sat in on. And he, all of these kids were in front of him. They were listening to his every word as he explained what that missing angle on a hexagon was. And I watched him and I thought, I know what I want to be now that I am a grown up. I want to be a maths teacher just like you. That's it. <laughs>